Test, test, one, two, three, four. This is a new way that I'm going to plan to do the uh, recording this week. So hopefully you see that. My slide's advancing. And uh, look forward to seeing how this turns out. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Friday afternoon, and uh, I'm uh, getting this uh, prepared for our gathering on Sunday. We'll be meeting all together in uh, at 10 o'clock uh, in the auditorium. And I know there is an issue about uh, weather, so we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, it may be that uh, if it's really bad, we'll meet all online. And that would include our business meeting, our annual meeting, uh, at the end of that time. That's mainly going to be a budget issue that we need to uh, uh, get voting approval on from those of you who are official members. Um, so we'll keep you posted. Um, it may be that we're a few of us there and everyone else online, but if you are an official member, <clears throat> please make it a point to be uh, there uh, either in person or online on Sunday so that we do have our necessary numbers for uh, quorum and uh, approval. And again, we'll do that towards the end of our meeting, probably not more than a uh, 10 to 20 minute time just to go over the budget and answer any questions that you might have. We believe that's the only official action we need to take this year. You will get a, a copy of the report sent to you uh, probably at the earliest on uh, Saturday uh, night at 6 uh, p.m. We're targeting that, but uh, if it's not ready at that time, certainly you'll have it by uh, Sunday morning when the early Sunday morning email goes out uh, and the budget uh Everything that uh, uh, we'll be voting on will be in there, plus the reports. We won't review those reports, but we will um, uh, just take a time to to do to work with the budget. And uh, I may make a, a few passing comments during our time on Sunday, but um, all that will be there for your reading. And uh, we'll uh, uh, just look forward to the year ahead, uh, even as we. Uh, Really appreciate all that God has done in the year past and what a year it has been. Um, but we have uh, we've gone faithfully through it, and I want to commend all of you for your uh, just determination and commitment to uh, continue to follow Christ together and to do anything necessary in terms of energy and learning new things in order to uh, um, be a fully participating member of his family and his mission in the world uh, as best we can during this time really really has been an, an exceptional year and so many good things that we didn't expect that you would have thought wouldn't happen in a year like this uh, have happened um, let me jump into the uh, teaching for today and um, there'll be other announcements uh, tomorrow or on Sunday I should say through the week uh, our usual uh, schedule of things but I uh, just want to get you into the teaching today. I've titled this one uh, in this section of 1 Peter 4, 12 to 19, All Things Considered, He simply he Will Simply Never Fail Us. And uh, that's sort of a, the beginning of the end of Peter's letter here. And uh, a real capstone given where he's uh, brought us in the letter, brought the reader in the letter, uh, brought those original uh, churches in this letter. Uh, and where we're going to end uh, as we finish this section in the next uh, couple of weeks. So we're uh, coming towards the end of First Peter, and um, a few uh, few weeks to go here, probably um, somewhere in mid-March uh, we'll be finishing this series up. Um, I will again go through uh, these slides because you'll have them uh, to uh, read online. You'll be able to get a uh, link to them to view them, and I, I believe you might be able to download them. If you want to download them, let me know, and if you're not able... But there'll be a link to the slides that are in Google Drive um, in below in the uh, in this video. So down in the description, you'll find uh, that as well. Um, again, we're now starting this third section of uh, the body of Peter's letter. And uh, we saw um, the crucial point there where they, we had the hinge uh, there between... Uh, uh, the first spot part of the body, uh, the, the the section describing their their new and our new family identity, and that of suffering as a witness to Jesus, uh, to this third part, which is now uh, start going from our suffering and on to our our future hope, and uh, really ending with um, 
and closing everything on a, a, a strong note of encouragement and uh, um, exhortation to remain firm and unchallenged in the light of what's happening around us, uh, just as it was with them, but knowing what's going to happen fully and completely in the end uh, when Jesus uh, finishes his, uh, his work, the work that he has begun uh, with his death, burial, and particularly his resurrection. And that's a promise that we can bank on. That's uh, what the focus of this body, this part of the letter is from 4.12 to 5.9, with a closing in 5.10 to 14 just after that. And this section today in 4.12, actually going on into 19, uh, I've put that package of that together, that really, again, relying on Jesus' promise here. And you see in the video and in the uh, um, literary design um graphic that we have here from the Bible Project, uh, you can see references to that in Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Um, there are also some references to Zechariah uh, that Peter makes here uh, as well. So there are a number of things where Peter's really bringing the story to its, uh, to its conclusion or his purpose and in, uh, in, in their, their understanding of their lives in the story to its proper conclusion. And uh, that's where we're, we're, we're at as well and thinking ahead and and relying on these things for our lives today. So we're thinking together each and every week to a wise uh, uh, course of action as a result of what we're learning together. And again, um, understanding how, you know, what the New Testament is, and you can see in a microcosm of it here in Peter's letter that the, micro, the New Testament is designed to draw us into the story of God's plan to rescue the world from chaos and idolatry and to launch his new transformative creation. And that's substantially begun in Jesus, is yet to begin, uh, or is yet to be f completed with Jesus' return and the renewal of all things. So we live in a time of the overlap of the ages. The old world goes on even while the new one has been launched with Jesus' resurrection, but eventually the old world will uh, fall away, will be, uh, will be done away with. And that's what we saw about uh, saw last week. The end of the world is near, Peter said. That's what he meant. The end of the age that's been overlapping the one that began with Jesus' resurrection is going to come to a decisive conclusion and end, and uh, God will, will, uh, will deal with that. And, uh, but his new creation, which began with Jesus' resurrection, will continue on, and you will be part of that. You've been transferred from one age to the next, one world to the next, if you think in terms of time. And so if you can picture it in that way, perhaps it helps you to understand where we fit on the whole scheme of things. But our job is to be part of God's rescuing plan for those who are still caught in the old age and uh, are part of that which will be judged and dealt with uh, by God, as we've seen in the previous passages too. My summary thoughts last week and uh, just by the way, you notice you're not seeing me in this video. I found a, perhaps a cleaner and a better way to try to make uh, these videos. So I hope you don't mind that. And uh, But you will hear my voice hopefully more clearly and see the images here clearly and stay focused on that. But here was my summary from last week that with our new identity and purpose in Christ, which is at odds with the world and its vision of now and the future. The world has a completely different vision of, than Christ does of what's going on now or the present and the future. We must remain firmly and intentionally rooted in the Creator's life and His purposes. That is expressed in practical ways in God's family and a signpost to the world that God's new future has begun in Jesus' life and that its ways will come to a decisive end. That's the end of that old age we were just talking about. Love is the language of that future and brings greatness to Jesus now and always. And so we're learning to speak that language and to... to uh, reflect and and represent the culture of the future uh, that will be God's uh, future and his kingdom. I um, go back to a quote that helps summarize uh, some of what we're looking at in the last section that Peter here is treading, treading a fine line. He's not glorifying suffering for its own sake, quite the contrary. He's not saying you should go looking for it, but just as the crucifixion of the Messiah was at the same, at the same time the most wicked thing humans ever did, and the most powerfully loving thing God ever did. So the wickedness of those who persecute God's people forms the strange frame within which the power of God's transforming love can shine through all the more strongly. 
in some ways, God set the stage for not only evil to be seen for what it is, but for his love to be seen as what it is at the same time. That's supremely in Jesus. And that is the scene that God has created for us and has called us to live in as well. Uh, living amidst um, that inhumanity or that brokenness of human beings, sometimes uh, even brought on by ourselves, but at the same time, uh, living in and recognizing and having present and available to us uh, the powerful love of God uh, that that over, overcomes the things of the world. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Um, as we approach the passage today, um, three things, basic questions we always need to ask about when we when, or ask when we come to uh, a, a, any passage in Scripture. What is the author, in this case Peter, talking about? What is he saying about this subject? And why is Peter saying this? Those are some basic questions you want to have in your mind and uh, and and keep in the in the, in your thinking as you uh, read through any passage of Scripture. This is what we do in our first principles studies in that study the scriptures section. So we don't do that any different when we uh, take these things and put them uh, before us all as we uh, learn and 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 uh, gather together and discuss as a community as well. So Peter goes on to say this. Um, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you'll be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. Quite the contrary, in other words. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. That's our passage for today and uh, the word that God has us to consider together uh, as we uh, look at the teaching of the Apostle Peter here to the churches then and uh, for us today as well. So again, thinking about those questions that I gave you prior to reading the passage, how would you summarize this passage in your own word? Sort of taking your response and your thinking about those three questions, uh, what, what Peter's talking about, what he's saying about that, and why is he saying it, and summarizing that in a way that uh, expresses your own expression, your own understanding of what Peter intends to say here. That's a good beginning point, and I encourage all of you to do that, even as, in a minor way, uh, just as a means of, of learning uh, and uh, really getting uh, the, the ideas here to uh, stick in your mind. So let's look at the first one, and I want to unpack it a little bit. I've highlighted here uh, some of the things that might be surprising when you look at you know, fiery trials, uh, but it shouldn't shock them. Uh, he says, cut the contrary, instead of being surprised and instead of being shocked as if something strange or unexpected was happening, be glad when you see these things. Um, why? Because you're partners with Christ. Uh, to what end? So that you'll have wonderful joy uh, when his glory is revealed to all the world. Um, a strange juxtaposition. We've seen this in Peter already. And again, it sort of begins to summarize. You can see how Peter is sort of bringing his argument and his uh, teaching to a climax here in this last part of the uh, book. But why should fiery trials not surprise us? And what is this deep joy of being in being partners of Jesus? What's that all about? Um, some help from some authors that uh, we can consult here. Um, Jesus has rescued his people from the power of evil, but they're still to expect this time of fiery ordeal. It isn't something strange. It's what the scriptures had foretold. It is not pleasant to be persecuted, but if, when it happens, you can see it as a road sign telling you that you are on the right path, that, make, may, that may make all the difference. Suffering for a purpose because you are in the journey towards Christ. You are, you are part of the new age. You're part of the new world that Jesus has birthed with his uh, life, death, and resurrection. If you're f suffering these things, 
in one sense, it's a comfort to say, ah, I must be in the right direction. I must be in the right relationship with God. I must be oriented to the future in a way that has put me at odds with the old world in its old way. Uh, that tells me I'm where I ought to be. Now I can rely on that and find insurance in that and to draw on it and depend upon God to, to, to move forward with that opposition and with that difficulty. Um, that may be the difference that you make. That may be the comfort, and it may be the only comfort you have sometimes in the midst of difficulty and suffering or misunderstandings or rejections of others. He also goes on to say, and uh, this popular commentary by uh, Tom Wright, the underlying problem is that this must have come as a great surprise to the early Christians to discover that even though the Messiah had been raised from the dead, there was still a period of time, the time they themselves were living through, in which intense suffering would occur, would occur to his people. Had he not defeated all the powers of sin and death, why should this still be happening? So you can imagine the frame of reference that these new believers had, having left their pagan lives and having really gotten excited about Jesus as king, that God had, had now done what he had promised to do, and they were now part of his people and brought into covenant relationship with him and a new, had a new outlook on things and had a, a, a new hope and a new faith and a new love for him and for one another and yet these things are still going on around that 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 can challenge your faith it can challenge your stability it can challenge your establishment or your strength and peter's wanting to work on that and to help them understand that um, this isn't a factor that it should affect your establishment or your being strong in the lord Quite the contrary, it's a sign you're in the right place, and it's a sign that just as Jesus was opposed in this way, so you too as his followers. And we've seen that theme over and over and over again. So in many ways, Peter, again, is just reinforcing things that he's already said, uh, but perhaps in a slightly different way. He goes on, Peter says, to uh, in, in uh, verses 14 through 16, and I've highlighted here a couple of pairs of opposites. Um, insulted and blessed, okay? On the one hand, you're insulted, but you need to think of yourself as blessed or you will be blessed. On the one hand, shame. On the other hand, privilege. You know, again, the idea of being insulted, the idea of, you know, of being put down, of, of, of you know, of being canceled, of being uh, told you're worth nothing, you're of no value, of, of, of losing your sense of, 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 of worth and purpose, um, even to the extent of losing possessions, you know, lack of dignity and things. You can imagine all kinds of things that have been done against Christians over the years and are still happening uh, today. But the other side of that, then, Peter says, is you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. The Spirit, that, like the Spirit that we're reading now about leading the Israelites in, through the wilderness, that Spirit is with you and is on you. It's a, it's a sign to you and should be to others that um, your, your future is guaranteed. Your inheritance is assured. There's nothing simply you can lose, uh, tangible or intangible in this life, that won't be greatly and gloriously replaced by your inheritance in um, the, the completion of God's worth in the kingdom that was yet to be fully and completely realized. Um, that's a glorious spirit. And it's glorious in the sense of its of his presence, but also of what he's accomplishing. You know, think about what he's done in you. Think about how much has changed in your life. Think about the things that, that uh, just have re reshaped you uh, and the new opportunities and new people, the new family that you're part of. That's the work of the Spirit. And it brings us to a position that we know we didn't deserve and never would have found on our own, but yet here we are. And we're sharing that with, with God and with his, with his people. And His Spirit is in the midst of us. So very, very important. You certainly don't want to suffer for the wrong things. That's the things that you know deserve suffering. Uh, no, on the contrary, these things, uh, you know, insult and blessing, that contrast is because... You're in the right place with God. So is shame and uh, privilege. You know, shame, lack of status, um, lack of, of, of resources, uh, lack of, 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 of name, of identity, of purpose. A person who's been shamed has, has uh, you know, uh, 
really lost everything that everyone else values and uh, and and sees them as an equal or as a peer. You know, Jesus' shame on the cross, everything was taken away from him. Even his ability to, you know, to breathe ultimately uh, was was taken away by the hands of cruel people, you know, uh, nailed to a wood so that you couldn't move, you can't help yourself, and no one else is allowed to help you. There could be no greater shame, no worse way to die, but yet God raised him up, and that was the way, that was the, the, the means to his uh, glory. Um, and to be called by that same name, to know that that was Jesus' path, that path is going to end the same way for us, and it's a privilege to have that name now. It looks like shame and is, is used as shame on the part of the world around us, the old world, but it is a, a name of highest privilege uh, that those who know God and are part of his people understand and who are part of this new world that God is going to bring to a full and, and a complete restoration uh, one day. Um, what's the significance of those realities for the followers of Jesus? Think about that. Think about when you've experienced those things and how those things are juxtaposed together at the same time as a Christian. Have you ever had that sense of, of shame and privilege at the same time? And why is it important to balance both of those things? Um, can you imagine a time when that would be um, absolutely important, like it was for those in Peter's writing here? The commentator goes on to say about this passage, the heart of the passage is in verse 14. That this is really at the core of what Peter's doing. If you're abused because of the name of the Messiah, you're blessed by God because the Spirit of glory and God of God is resting upon you. The persecutors will lay a charge against you, in other words, that you belong to Jesus, known as Messiah, but the very naming of Jesus and giving him his royal title invokes Jesus himself in all his majesty and glory, and the curses the persecutor wants to call down on you turn into blessings instead. I'm reminded that we're in the book of Numbers right now in our Bible reading, and soon we'll be coming to the story where um, the, 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 the inhabitants of the land uh, that uh, see the, the camp of the Israelites coming uh, against them, um, you know, hire, uh, Balak hires Balaam, uh, this uh, sorcerer, to, to go to a high place and to stand over the camp of Israel and to curse them. And try as he might, God does not allow him to do it. You know, look at the evil intentions that are working against God and his purposes through his people. But at the same time, God doesn't allow it. He turns his curse into blessing. You know, there's a there's a powerful image there, and we see a pattern that's echoed here in the same thing in our lives. No matter what, uh, you know, others may do intentionally or unintentionally as a means of degrading or uh, de, de uh, you know, deplatforming, if you will, canceling Jesus. It, it, it just can't be done. Uh, it, it won't be done. And uh, Jesus has already won and he will win. And uh, humbly, we, we trust in that and understand that uh, there's deep amount of blessing in that. And uh, anyone who uses Jesus against us uh, is actually serving his purposes by elevating and and. Hopefully they humbly recognize and understand that and, and turn in repentance and turn to him. But if not, they will be shown uh, for the foolish uh, uh, um, ways that they've exhibited, but that they've invoked a name that is not a name or not in any way associated with curse or shame, but is actually a way of blessing and a means of blessing. And they missed out on it. They missed out on it. But God willing, they may see the light prior to uh, coming to that terrible fate. And he talks about that in this next passage. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. I highlight that because we often think about judgment as a negative thing. Oh, that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. What he's talking about here is it's time for us to clean house in the sense of, you know, get all the things out that have any, that will, will, have anything to do with the world. And he's talking about the church here and the relationships and, um, you know, who they are and what they do together. Anything that's coming against God's purposes and the name that they bear together has to be thrown out. Uh, get rid of it. Uh, toss it aside. Get it. 
it doesn't belong in the family of God. Um, it, 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 that's where it's supposed to happen. That's where it must happen because this is where God's purposes and his future lies is right there in you. You're signposts to that. Um, and then he goes on to say, if it begins with us, what terrible fate for those who have never obeyed. Um, it, it's supposed to happen with us, but what then about those who, who can't without turning to Jesus and being and um, and, and, and looking to him for, for salvation. We're talking about forgiveness and salvation and, and uh, um, ongoing holiness and righteousness, the right kind of living and thinking uh, as covenant partners with God. And if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? A lot of hyperbole here, but uh, not, uh, not untrue, uh, but said in a stark way. You know, we're... Peter uses the phrase here, you know, you who are reading this are barely saved. What about those who don't even have that? Uh, that's a strange way to put it, and we need to stop and honestly think about what that means. Question that's raised, those, why is the time for judgment now, and why first in us? Well, I started to talk a little bit about that. What does it mean anyway? I encourage you to think even more deeply about it, what Peter's saying here. Once again, Peter reminds his readers that they must see everything that is happening in light of the final judgment which is yet to occur. So we've got to keep the big picture in mind. The outcome is not in doubt. Jesus will vindicate his faithful people. You know, and that's really where he ended this last section of his letter, um, as we saw back up to 411. But even for them, the thought uh, ought to be sobering. Judgment will begin, not with the obviously wicked, but with God's own household, as we see in verse 17. It has to begin with us, and it makes sense when you put it in the context here. You know, uh, God wants those who know him and walk with him to be his examples and to, and to live his life in the world uh, towards their certain future, uh, knowing that that judgment is going to come. God is going to throw evil out of the world, and uh, that means it needs to be uh, rid, gotten, gotten rid of amongst us now in every way so that we're living in all aspects of, you know, what we often refer to as the, the Didache, the Apostles' teaching. That ought to be excelling in us and ought to be maturing as individuals, as families, as a community, and in, in our relationship to the world. He goes on to say that from God's, holy, God's perspective, the holiest, most loving person is still someone who needs to be rescued. And it's still so weighed down with sin that without the grace and mercy shown through Jesus that rescue would not happen. If we're ever tempted to think, you know, and Peter's speaking to believers here, he's not speaking to non-believers. But if we're ever tempted to think that we're okay on our own, or we sort of get lulled into the fact that, you know, hey, we're pretty good compared to everybody else. They deserve it and we don't. No, stop and think, you know, you were saved by grace. You continue to be saved by grace. You know, God has given you a gift uh, it's not something you've discerned or earned or worked for, but it's something that he has given you and set you apart for a special purpose that hopefully others too will find that gift and you might be a means of, of uh, demonstrating it to them and offering it to them. Um, we This keeps us in a humble place uh, and a thankful place and a worshipful place, uh, always and, and ever reminding ourselves and, and reminding one another that uh, we... We have been saved by grace. We have been rescued um, because of God's love and his initiative, uh, his unfailing love. And uh, next series, we're going to start to look at that. Uh, one of the most widely repeated descriptions of God that we see in the Old Testament and a new set of videos that have been produced for that that will help us uh, in this uh, uh, in this. Uh, time where we're doing things online and other things, just another way of uh, being able to get down and to think deeply about some things that um, have great implications for us today. He goes on to say that uh, if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. There's the capstone right there. Um, keep doing what is right. Uh, don't let the suffering deter you from what you need to be doing. The suffering is not driving uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, the suffering does not define you. The suffering is or is not in it, but you keep doing what is right. 
and you keep trusting your lives to God and trusting your lives in the sense of your whole being, your whole self, everything that you are, um, you know, God who created you, <laughs> what part of you didn't God create? Uh, if you can find it, then you can keep it for yourself. But everything that you are, God created from the beginning and every capacity and gift and talent and resource and thing that you've had and, and thing that you've created has come ultimately from his creation of you. All of that is to be trusted to him. He will never fail you. He will never fail you. Um, stop and think and reflect and ponder that deeply. Uh, praise God for it. Um, uh, it should uh, it should really really provoke us and, and evoke in us a deep sense of gratitude and thanks and uh, and humility again. How can we be confident that we are suffering in a right way? And what is the deep encouragement here? Uh, kind of my comments just now about what to reflect reflect on and to think about. Those who are at present persecuting the church will meet their own judgment in due course. And God's people are called in the meantime to faith and patience. In particular, they should entrust their whole lives to God, their faithful creator. I made some comment on that just now. We might expect this to mean that they should pray day by day, giving over their lives to God, and no doubt this will be true as well. But Peter says something a bit different. They are entrust their lives to God by doing what is good, staying the course, doing what is right. We saw that. This doesn't just mean rule keeping, keeping your nose clean, not getting into trouble. Doing good is much more positive than that. Here's the point. It means bringing fresh goodness, fresh love, fresh kindness, fresh wisdom into the community, into the family, to the people we meet on the street. When we do this, we are not saying, look at me, aren't I being good? We are saying to God, I trust you. This is what you have called me to do. This is what I'm doing with the life you've given me. Even though I am facing suffering, I will continue to be this sort of a person to your glory. What a statement, what, a, what a, 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 an intention that all of us could have in doing that, not only before God, but together with one another. This is what makes for a strong church. Uh, individuals who are making this kind of commitment to God and they share it together in their relationship with Him. Um, we're all part of the same story. Summarizing today, those in Jesus' new family with this new identity and purpose have a straightforward and simple hope. Jesus will never fail them. That is true now and always will be. It should motivate us now to live from the joy and privilege we now possess and will see firsthand in the future and bring the renewal of, to the world around us that is core to who we are and will one day be the reality in all of God's world. We have an opportunity to not just... Uh, hang on until suffering is gone, but to actually change the world in the midst of it. Um, and it's rooted again deeply in Jesus and his promises here that he will never fail us. And uh, that his glory rests with us now, and we will see that glory firsthand in the future. The glory in the sense of what it will look like when Jesus rules all things and there is no opposition, when everything is as it should be. Um, when the president sits down in his office, there is his glory. He's running things. Uh, it's more than just a title. It's the actual uh, status and the ability and the, and the power that he has, that he, ex that he exerts, just to use an example. So what changes in our thinking and actions as individuals or as a community need to be renewed? What is this challenge in you and in us? What are the things that we need to attach these ideas to in our world today and really do something about or think differently about? That's the challenge that we have as we uh, get together. And I've got some questions for you to think through uh, prior to our time Sunday. Part of Christian faith is the subtle belief that God is faithful and that we can rely on him utterly at this point as at all others and get on with the task of bringing his light and love into the world. Great statement. Might even be worth committing to memory. Um, we can um, rely on him and get on with the task of bringing his light and love into the world. Those two things go together even when suffering is at its greatest. Um, and may God give us grace to help to understand and practice these things should and when that ever happen. Some questions to keep in mind for Sunday. 
When has it helped you to, uh, to expect and be unsurprised by the challenges we face as followers of Jesus? Why is it necessary not to be surprised at fiery trials and not to be shocked at the things as they are? What happens if we don't? Um, Peter's called us to. How can the privilege of being called by Jesus' name affect our daily life in practical ways? Maybe that's something you consider and have, have something to say about. How can our humility and reliance on God's grace help us be the kind of community that's free of the things we so off, see so often in the human ways of the world? How can judgment begin with the family of God? In other words, throwing out the, 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 the yeast, throwing out the, the, the impure things, throwing out the things that uh, will keep us from uh, um, walking you know, in the, with the glorious presence of Christ. This is some of the things that we're reading again in uh, Leviticus and Numbers these days. And what does it look like to travel and to journey with God in your midst, right there in the tent and the camp around it? You know, that's what all of these rules and rituals were all about. How can we live with God in the midst of us? You need to throw these things out. Take it outside the camp. Uh, you know, get rid of this, uh, even to the extent of taking harsh punishment on those who continue to. Uh, um, distort and uh, ignore God's ways. We see some strong things in the teaching that we're reading in Numbers, and uh, we'll continue even as we go into Deuteronomy in the weeks to come. So if you're in the Bible reading, you're, you're hearing some echoes of these things right now. To what extent is your reliance upon Jesus shaping the good works you are called to do? The things that you do, or perhaps are not doing, that you should do, uh, how are they associated with your reliance upon Jesus? Your, your confidence, your sure confidence in Him and what He's going to grant, His ultimate vindication of all things and you with it, uh, you know, in, in light of His purposes. Um, another question to consider. So I'll uh, um, end it there and uh, look forward to our time together uh, this coming Sunday. Again, we'll be all together uh, at 10 o'clock. And those of you who are normally on with Zoom at 12 o'clock, we will be together at 10 o'clock. All will be together in person and on Zoom uh, at 10 o'clock. And uh, we'll close uh, our time or move in our time into that uh, short uh, annual meeting uh, where we need to take a, a business action on the budget that's been proposed for the year to come. And uh, we'll keep you posted on uh, what weather uh, dictates to us uh, on that day. So look forward to seeing you all. Uh, God bless and have a great weekend.